Hey everybody, and welcome to the One Lane Road Podcast with me and DK. What's up, guys? Hey, uh, t- today's a super special episode. Uh, we have the, our first call-in guest, and man, is it a big one. We have Mr. Kevin Dyson, one of the most famous wide receivers in Tennessee Titans history. Um, man, welcome to the show. Thanks for calling in, for sure. Oh, man, no problem. Anything, man. I'd love to help. Good. Yeah, we had uh we've been talking to a couple of different guys and like I like I was telling you on Messenger yesterday, you were like a you know, definitely top uh top of the line for me, you know, one of my favorite players growing up. And uh just getting to meet you a couple of times in, you know, Nashville over the years, it's a pretty big deal, you know, to have you call in, so I do appreciate it. I had no problem. You trying to date me a little bit, say when you were growing up. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hear, I hear, I heard the little, you know, while I was growing up, you know, I appreciate that. <laughs> oh no, man, no. If you heard, if you heard our Shaq episode a couple of weeks ago, you feel a lot better about yourself. Oh yeah, he's got a big crush on Shaq. <laughs> Shaq's my man. So I finally got to meet yeah. him a couple, a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, yeah. I guess I kind of grew up watching him too. He's always only a few years older than me. Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, I guess just tell us a little bit. Um, you know, you were you were involved the first year of, of Nashville. You know, you had to deal with the whole thing with the Vanderbilt Stadium. How was that? You know, coming into Nashville, coming out straight out of Utah. Uh, well, for me, it, it was it was it was okay. I mean, it was similar to the environment I was used to at Utah. You know, I mean, I didn't play in a, a ninety thousand plus uh, seat stadium, um, so my adjustment for a home crowd was. It was seamless because my home crowds were actually a little bit bigger than Vanderbilt State <laughs> actually holds. Um, so, you know, I, I was, that was familiarity to me. I mean, the biggest crowd I had played in front of it up to that point, up until I got to the pros, was like 70,000 or so. Um, and so, you know, it was it was old home for me. Uh, our locker rooms actually were bigger than Vanderbilt. So, you know, it was, <laughs> it, was it was a lot of similarities to college so the transition wasn't like oh i'm in awe i'm going to this this big thing and i think now it's almost deflating for these kids because the organizations and the facilities that the kids are getting in college are actually better than pros a lot of times yeah man it's pretty amazing when you see what oregon does out there for that program it's pretty ridiculous right what? and you see what ut's even done I mean, it's, it's a recruiting tool alabama and and uh, UT, Oregon, I can go down. Even Utah now has a multi-million dollar facility that really? they use for their athletes. And, yeah, it, it's just a recruiting tool. Um, you got you, That's the only way you can kind of level the playing field, so to speak. And then these, obviously these big-time contracts with merchandisers like Nike and Under Armour is also a big deal. Right. Uh, what, uh, I wonder if you talked for a minute about uh, you, was, uh, you was part of the team that actually built na- the Nashville built the Nashville scene for the Tennessee Titans. You know, you, y'all come in the first year or whenever into Nashville to kind of help build that. What was that like for you guys down there? Uh, you know what? I wasn't here in that transition when they were going from here to Memphis and kind of dealing with that, not really having a home, so to speak. And, um, I mean, I came here to tell them we were in, in Bellevue and some um, portables and, uh, and then, of course, the transition to facilities and getting our own stadium and, and things like that. And, and then we just – we ended up being like rock stars for a little that year because <laughs> yeah. we ended up having a, a pretty good year. I mean, there was times where uh, we couldn't even go anywhere. Uh, you know, it really, literally was like being rock stars. Javon Curse and guys came on board, and we made that playoff run. I remember we were at the mall and we had to shut down a store because it just we just got bombarded. You know, because people just wanted to get autographs and just. To be associated with us, and of course, being with Javon Curse doesn't doesn't hurt. Right. But you know, he was having a great rookie year, yeah. and um, at that time, uh, we just had to shut down the mall, and we had to sneak us out the building, and so, <laughs> and that that was amazing. And, you know, yeah, it's got to feel good, right? Man, and, and the, the 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 community, the way we were embraced during that run, and then built that uh, fan base. You know, it was something special. And even if they go on another run. Uh, here in the next several years, it'll never be like that first one because that that was something unique. I, I've it not was the first time as a team. I've not seen a stadium like that, you know, ever since. Really, I think you. I mean, it goes without saying, you guys really spoiled Nashville that first year. You know, it's hard to hard to top what you guys did. Oh yeah, it, it was, right. It's been uh, you know kind of a letdown ever since. It's like, man, that very first team was so good. Where where'd everybody go? What are we doing to ourselves? Right, exactly, <laughs> and I think we set that precedent so early that a lot of people I mean, call it what it is. Yeah. They they got spoiled, you yeah, know. They, really uh, did. they got spoiled spoiled to 
what they actually thought the NFL would be like. And, you know, they're not used to lean years. I mean, you look how, how long, say, Green Bay Packers were down or the Bears or even New England. The, uh, the Patriots were down for the late 80s to most of the 90s until they were the Super Bowl in, what, 95, I think they went with Parcells. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, there's been a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of, teams that have to do to go through that process and we started this thing so early that it's hard for the people building a fan base with new team they're not used to that and so they they kind of have jumped ship and gone to their old teams if you will the Steelers and whoever it may be might be Packers who knows yeah I know because one thing I you know I've noticed there there wasn't a lot of opposing play, um, fans in the stadium back then it was a hard ticket to get and now you come in and you're just like you know, when the Steelers are in town, it's it's seventy five percent Pittsburgh fans, I would say. But exactly, and I get that because before the Titans got here, you know, it was there was so many Steelers fans just because that's what that's what you saw on TV. But what kills me is when you go and you see, you know, so many I don't know Forty ers fans or just some random teams that you wouldn't think would have association. I mean, I know when I went to the game last year when we played Miami, the whole opposite the the other side of the stadium was chanting Dan Marino. You know, that's pretty deflating, man. <laughs> right. You know, and it, it's, you know, the teams like Carolina Panthers and, and things, they're, 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 they're getting more fans and seats than we are. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a little frustrating. I know the players are a little frustrated. I, I can only imagine. Um, but at the end of the day, winning cures all. Yeah. You start winning and you start getting a home field advantage like we had, you know, it won't be like that. People won't give up them seats. It'll be, and then it'll become a hard ticket to get. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah so, wins, you know, wash away sins. That's right. right. Got to win. That's right. Um, you know, you, you just mentioned your playoff run. You're uh, responsible to, for being in two of, the, two of the most famous plays in Tennessee Titan history, the Music City Miracle and the Tackle. Uh, I mean, yeah. what's that like to wear around? <laughs> well, man, I, I tell people like this, you know, uh, in sport, you always got to have the yin with the yang. That's right. You know, the good and the bad. Uh -huh. and unfortunately, I was part of uh, on both ends of the spectrum within a two or three week period. Right. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you'll hear me say this uh, until the day I they, they bury me six feet under. Is Not everybody comes to the NFL as a Hall of Famer. If it was then the Hall of Fame wouldn't be special. Uh -huh. um, but the NFL is made up of role players. Everybody, it's not made up of Hall of Famers. Those are far and few between. There's only 1,500 of them. So, and there's there's literally hundreds of thousands of players that have played in that league that are not Hall of Famers. So, um, you know, you, you, to have something that they can hold my hat to or have a legacy after, you know, it's, it's pretty special. So, um, you know, just following your career and following that play, um, you weren't the first option, right? On that on that uh, Music City Miracle. Uh, no, nah, I wasn't even supposed to be on the field. Right. <laughs> take, take us through yeah, that if you don't you mind. Know, uh, you know, Derek Mason had gone out with a concussion, um, and the backup kick returner was Anthony Dorsett Jr. Mm -hmm. And he had gone out with a uh, for cramping and the irony there was I was cramping up yeah. myself and went and got IVs about the time Derek Mason got his concussion. So it just <laughs> it was just ordained, man. It was just one of those things I was I was supposed to be a part of that play. Uh, and then the gist of the play is, you know, uh, Frank Wycheck, uh handles the squib, which is typical of at that situation. They squib, but they bloop the kick. And Lorenzo Neal, who might have been the, the – least skilled of the skilled players when it comes <laughs> to catching a football of all of us and of all our skill guys and he uh he made the catch and he had to know what's all to get to frank and, and the little no history about that fact is he told frank that was going to happen he said I'm oh gonna man the ball and i'm gonna get it to you and you're gonna go around you're gonna make you're gonna do make your play and the actual guy who's supposed to catch lateral would have been Derek mason but since he was out Isaac Bird moved into the number one spot, and he came up because the ball was blooped, and I ended up being in the position he should have been. And then the rest is history. Rest I is just history. got the ball and ran. 
Yeah. No, no cramps. It, there looks like your legs look good for 75 yards right there, Al. That's it, man. I, hey, good thing we got the IV. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I can't imagine, man, how, how how crazy that stadium was that day. I mean, I've seen it on TV. I wasn't there, but I could just imagine, man, how, how pumped that place was. Oh, I bet you was pumped. I mean, I bet it was – I bet you was through the roof yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, at the moment, you don't hear anything. You know, yeah. I, I think um, – more or less, we, you know, we kind of block out noise. You're just so focused in. You don't see much more than what's going on in that, in that 53 and the third and 100 yards, 110, 120 yard box, you know, or rectangle. And, um, uh, but now when I watch the replays or I see the replays, you know, I tend to watch everything but me. I watch the other players. I watch the crowd. I watch the other teammates. I watch the response to the, the people carrying on. I, I like watching that. Yeah, that's where I get kind of those goosebumps and that 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 feel of that moment again. Because you know, we going through it, you don't get to enjoy it. And then it was only the wild card. You know, yeah. you still got the conference divisional game. You still got the conference championship game. Then, you, then we end up making it to the Super Bowl. So you really couldn't really truly truly enjoy what actually took place. And I always told myself I wouldn't until I retired anyway. So. um you know, I, I enjoyed it, and it was a good thing. I got to enjoy it, and and now I, I get to enjoy it a little bit more. Right. It's, it's funny you say that because you're talking about the reactions. One of my favorite things to look back at, and it's actually a picture I've had blown up, and it's it's framed in my um, my sports room, is uh is McNair's face as you're running the ball down the sideline. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen Steve's face a hundred times. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually have a, that picture in my in my house as well, man. It's just it was just a pure amazement, you know. Stuff like that doesn't happen all the time, and I think that's the beauty of it. I think that's the whole um, essence of sport. You know, if you're going to – how often you get to experience or be a part of a moment like that, even as a fan, and let alone as a player, where you're a part of a moment like that that's a, basically a once-in-a-lifetime moment, you know, because there will never be anything like it. There might be laterals and laterals and a bunch of laterals that might come up, but – it won't be like that. There might be game winning catches, but it won't be like that. You know, there's it's just to be a part of something like that, man. There's all those hundreds of thousands of people in that sixty eight thousand seat stadium that got to experience that. You know, it, that's something special for everybody. Oh, it yeah. was awesome, and it was it was kind of that kind of you know spoke a lot for the team that year too. You know, there was a lot of magic happening, man. That sure was magic, then when that happened. Yeah, right, I, I, right. I feel it's coming back around, but man, there's a lot to be said for that team. For like. Like I said, for the role players like you, Chris Sanders and and uh, and D Mace, and I mean to have a bruising back like Eddie, one of the all time greats, and you know Steve McNair, and we can't say good enough about McNair. Then also Frank, but like you said, Javon. I mean, we hadn't seen many rookie seasons like Javon had that year. I mean, since no, then. You, you, you probably won't. You know, uh, the tackles are getting a lot better these days, and I think you get you've seen these athletes. You go see guys put up numbers, going to put up sacks, especially with their every down. Uh, type of defensive lineman, but um, yeah, that was kind of a special run too. I mean, it's just a lot of things, man. Just seemed to just fall into place around that time. We, 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 we had a a good run. You saw a record breaking season on a lot of different fronts. We had good leadership. We had a good mix of old and young um, uh, players. Uh, so it, it was fun. It was real fun. Who do you think probably was the hardest um, hardest defender on you when you were playing? Uh, defensive back wise, yeah. Oh man, there's there were several. Uh, Aaron Glenn, Sean Springs, um, Charles Woodson, uh, Eric Allen, um, Aeneas Williams, Deion Sanders. Um, I think I'm naming pretty much everyone that'll be a <laughs> Hall of Famer. As a matter of fact, so you did tell you why they're good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I I was fortunate enough to go against some pretty good corners. What do you think about the kid that came out this year, local kid Ramsey? Do you think uh how do you think he's gonna do? I, I think he'll be I think he'll be a good player. I, I, I think I I know a lot of people are here wanted the Tigers to draft him and I may be a of the minority on that. I, I think <laughs> he's a good football player and I think he would help the Titans, but I don't think you spend a number one pick on a defensive back. Um uh, they don't have that kind of luxury to make that kind of impact. Um a quarterback does obviously a tackles is a franchise player and the running back, you know, you know, the rest of us are kind of, and maybe a defensive end, uh, but the rest of us are kind of that next level of picks, you know, that right. that are part of the first round. But 
you know, you if you're relying on a somebody to change your franchise around immediately, a corner or a defensive back is not someone you take number one overall, unless he's just that much better than everybody else in that draft that you have to take him. But you know, you got to take a quarterback, you got to take a, a guy to protect the quarterback, a guy that can poke the rock, and you probably got to get somebody to get after the quarterback. I think, uh, in my opinion, part of the big reason that everybody was wanting Ramsey just because he was from Brentwood. I don't know that if he was from Tallahassee or any, you know, or wherever, um, it would be a, the higher demand like that, you know. So, and they got a local kid. Right. They got they got the kid from MTSU who may, you know may turn out to be a pretty good ball player. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, it would just would have been a great story if Jalen could have came home and, and played. And had the Titans been three four, they may stay there and, and picked him. Right. But I don't, I just don't think they could have invested that money at number one on a defensive back. I still told myself I didn't care if the Titans got him or not, as long as Jacksonville didn't get him, so we wouldn't have to play him for ten years twice a year. And of course, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly what happened. So, yeah, I kind of figured that's where he'd land because the way they, the kind of the moves they've been making um, up until that point, kind of led you believe they're going to go with the best athlete available because uh, they didn't. They've been they've been filling up needs. You talk about a team that having a good off season aside the Titans. I think Jacksonville's had a great off season. Uh, they're going to be a team to to deal with this off season. Yeah, I wish they would hire their old GM back or whatever was going on. I don't I don't really like the Jags being relevant. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't like I agree. It. But I, I agree with I you. They agree. had a they had a great off season. Maybe an even better draft. So they're they whoever's running that show. I, don't, I can't remember his name, but uh, it looks like he knows what he's doing. But what do you think about uh about our GM? I love him. I, I think he's doing a great job. I think he has a plan and. He's he's establishing it. Uh, I think there's been a lack of communication between the GM head coach and maybe even uh, some of us in the community. But I think he's been forthright. I think he's uh, has stuck to his guns and um, he's he's sticking with it. Now I think for the most part, man, every every, every former player I've talked to is has echoed kind of the same sentiment. I think I think we're just all impressed by. Way he's going about his his business approach, his his in, in a way him and Malarkey seem to get along and are on the same page for the type of team they're trying to build. I think what Floyd Reese and Jeff Fisher had early on, uh, and when they were getting that thing together for us, uh, they went and got certain type of guys. You know, people go back to me versus Randy Moss draft pick. Well, I always tell people Randy Moss was go top five, I was supposed to go top ten. Yeah. Well, he dropped, I dropped. So I went <laughs> and I fit the mold of of the type of player that fit Floyd Reese, Jeff Fisher, Jeff Fisher style of play. Uh, it was a kind of a team first guy, a guy who blocked, did the little things and necessarily didn't demand the football, but would make plays if given opportunity. And that was the kind of player they wanted. And, you know, he Moss always, was a little different. He Moss obviously made the right decision. He demanded the football and he, he, he needed a ball in his hand and he was one of the best to ever do it. So, you know, and, and so that it goes back to, philosophy of GM and head coach and building a you have an idea in mind of what you want and that that is what's exciting to me is Malarkey and Robson seem to be like that they seem to have be on the same accord and and, and looking to go in a certain direction if it falters then they can say at least we did it our way yeah and that that style is exotic smash mouth do you know exactly what exotic smash mouth is right <laughs> Exactly, and and I think everybody's seen you get somebody like Derrick Henry, and and you got Demarco Murray, and you got a quarterback you need to protect. You draft a a, a tackle on that right side in the first round. I I think the assumption is we're going to run that ball downhill a little bit. Yeah, I think Lucas was going to ask you, but that was actually his next question. Was yeah about the uh, the Murray Henry combo. I, you know, I, I think this day and age, there's no there's really only one back in the NFL that's an every down back. I think most teams are doing it by committee anyway. I don't think I think Adrian Peterson might be the last of, the, of a dying breed. I mean, there's there's not too many. I mean, unless I'm wrong, do y'all think anybody else is an every down back anymore? I mean, there's guys getting you know 12, 13, 14 yards carries, but they're doing it with multiple guys. You know, so um, most guys are getting anywhere around that 18 to 22 carries a game. And they're sharing the other ten to twelve with two or three other guys, and I think that I think that's the philosophy you got to get. But you get a hot hand, you get a guy who seems to be hot. He's going to get the bulk of the carries that particular day, and and you see how it goes. And you might have two guys hovering over a thousand yards when it's all said and done. Yeah, our point a couple of weeks ago was that um, it's not like you know they they took Henry with a you know first round pick, or I mean he was their third second round pick. So, and I don't think it's given enough that Demarco. I mean. 
we hope for the best, but he he didn't have a great right. season last year. He's 28 years old, so and and I'm in the belief that Henry is an upgrade. I mean, no disrespect to the running backs the Titans have, but I, I think he's probably going to be an upgrade and probably the more style that they need. Right, and, and we'll see. I mean, again, you got a, a quarterback who has shown that he has the ability to toss the ball around the field as well. Uh, he obviously has some there's some things in the, in the off season he needs to work on. Um, from a personal standpoint, what I think he needs to work on is accuracy on the deep ball, mm-hmm. and, and he's got to hit some of those. How I many did he miss guys wide open uh, with deep ball by a yard or so? You know, just the, and that's just maybe something with touch or feel. Who knows? Uh, but it's things like that that he probably needs to work on, and um, we'll see. You know, and, but at the end of the day, it's still a passing league. You got to be able to throw the football effectively, or and to be successful in this league. And I, I think in the NFL is a recycled league. Um, you know, there's no the spread is not new. The uh, matter of fact, the wildcat is not new. That, that's something right. that's been recycled over the years of football. You know, you had the run and shoot. You had the four horsemen of Notre Dame running the the triple triple wing. Um, that was what the wildcat was. You know, so it's not like people are reinventing the wheel. They're just putting a little spin to it and calling it something different. And so everybody thinks they're smarter than everybody else. That's not the case, man. Everybody's doing the same thing. What happens is, you know. Defenses adjust to what the offense is doing, and then in order to combat what the defense is doing, as they get better, offense readjusts and, and combats that. So the, as the defense right now are getting smaller and quicker to combat the passing game, offense are getting bigger and more physical to start running the football. And what will happen is the defensive guys will get bigger and stronger again like they were, big corners, big linemen, big linebackers, to stop the running game and stop these big receivers, and then they'll, they'll do something different. So. Yeah. You know, it's just it's just a continuous cycle. You're always trying to gain the advantage some kind of way over your opponent. Well, when you talk about Marcus, uh, and, and I agree with the deep ball, uh, he is showing that he needs to improve on that. Um, and we talk about the, you know, the offensive line getting better and the uh, and the running game. So one thing we're talking about targets. What's your kind of assessment of the wide receiver situation in, in at the Titans right now? I may, you know, that's kind of a since it searches me since I played a position, I may have a different, little different spin than maybe uh, the the media, the brass, um, you know, what they feel like. I, I, I think receiver is a position that's a opportunity position. Um, you, you're as good as the opportunities you're given. Now, if you're given those opportunities, you don't make the plays. That's up to you. Uh, but you're in this league. There's not a whole lot of one on one. Um, there, and you, and when you do have those one-on-one battles, you do have to win more than you lose. But more often than not, teams develop and design plays to get mix, mix, mix matches and put guys in positions where they're not a whole lot of one-on-ones, where they don't have to lose. They're in zones. They're finding ways to get football. Julio Jones and these guys are not necessarily winning the one-on-one battles. They're in. They're going in zones, making plays in zones, and making run after the catch. There's not a whole lot of one on one anymore. I mean, and and when they do, they they win more than they lose, and that's the difference between, say, a Julio Jones or Megatron and some of these other receivers. Is they make more, they win more of the fifty fifty balls, the one on one battles than maybe the average guy, and that's it. And that's the difference between receivers. Because everybody's good. When you get to that level, man, everybody is good. Absolutely. Some guys are a little better at some things than others, but everybody can play. No franchise, no team is going to keep the guy that they don't think can help their franchise in some capacity win a football game. That just doesn't happen. Nobody's that dumb. I mean, even as a high school coach, I would if I didn't play a guy and I think, and he can help my team win, I'm an idiot. I have to play a guy that I think can help my team win. That's just the nature of the game. You know what I mean? So, you know, I you know I I, I get a little sensitive when I hear people talk about receivers, these receivers, not this and not that. Now, are they Julio Jones? No. You know, they're not there yet. They're not have that ability, but they have some ability. And it's all about game planning and putting guys in position to make plays. And now, once you do that, you, they got to make those plays. And we'll see what happens. Now, it, it, I, to me, Kendall is better than Julian Edelman just from a skill set. Uh-huh. But in a system that they utilize him in different ways. And what, what Kendall has been utilized in the last couple of years in, in Wizard Hunt offense. And I think he would be as bit, if not more successful in New England as Julian Elliman has been, just be just because of A, the quarterback, B, the system and, and the philosophy. So, you know, I, I it's just that's just my opinion. Well, I think it was Paul Kaharski that they said that maybe he didn't have enough freedom in Wizenhunt's system and he had too much prior to that. So we're trying to find like right. a 
a good ground for him. And, you know, I, I think we could see in the opener in Tampa Bay last year when, when Marcus threw the pass to him in the first play of the game, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, he's got wheels on him. And I know I talked to him after a couple of games last year, and it was really fr- – you know, he was getting frustrated with, with the system. And, and you, you know, I agree. I agree with the assessment over Edelman. And hopefully he'll get that uh, that chance this year. And uh, another guy is probably – you know, it's a it's kind of a make or break deal for him as a uh, Justin Hunter guy. You know, a lot of people root for around these parts. You know, just because his Knoxville connection, and he's a, and he's a good guy, it seems. Yeah, and I, I like Justin. I think just from an ability standpoint, he's good. I, I I think his issue goes back to what I was saying is when you're given those opportunities to make plays, you got to make them, and he hasn't been making them. Yeah. I think that's the difference in him. I don't. I think the ability is there. I'm, you don't draft a guy second round and he don't have the ability. You know what I mean? I, he definitely has the ability. I just think, for whatever reason, he's had a lot of head games in him. You can tell he thinks too much. He's trying too hard, if you will. I know people always say that, but I always trying too hard. And I, a lot of people don't know what that actually means. But he's, he, his hands are tensed up tight. He's trying to make plays mm-hmm. that are just doing what he knows he can do. And I've been there. I mean, that you know, ultimately, you end up dropping the ball or forcing a, a route or trying to get somewhere. Now you use the technique. And, you do some things that's not characteristic when you know you have the ability because you're in a rush to to be successful. And um, but that's the thing right now. He has it because the pressure's on. He he reads the newspapers. He hears people whispering. He hears the crowd booing. You know he hears that kind of stuff. And we're human. You know we're just like anybody else. Only our only thing is our job. More more importantly, their job. I'm no longer do it. It's public. You know, and it's for the public to make their assessment and their judgment of my performance. And that fair or unfair, that's what it is. You know, I, it'd be different if I can go to to the bank and look at that that branch manager and be like, "Oh, you did those numbers wrong. You terrible. You <laughs> suck. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take my business to AM South. You were, te-, you know what I mean? But we can't do that. You know, so it is what it is. You know, it's, we're pub- we're of the public opinion, and and it's it's unfortunate. But he's he's a good football player. He just got to make plays, and until he does that, he's gonna keep hearing it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a good assessment. And I guess the one that really excites me and excites a lot of people is the second round pick. Also, was that big, big DGB? I mean, he's just a big boy. Yeah, yeah. And to me, he's a big boy, um, but he doesn't have the skill set of like Julio Jones. I think he's a, he's a good receiver, but he doesn't have the hips. He don't have he don't have the fluidity. Mm-hmm. He's just a big body. Um, and in this day and age of football, he, he's a one side. Uh, football player. I mean, he's more or less outside receiver uh, to the split inside, um, and so and he's going to do more of the vertical stuff, skinny pose, the go route, and, and things of that nature. Um, so, yeah, you know, and he's got a lot of little things he needs to work on. To me, he needed to probably drop ten to fifteen pounds and play in that two twenty five mm-hmm. range, and that helped that some of that fluidity, some of that movement. You know, I think you look at somebody Julio Jones and some of those bigger receivers, those guys are very fluid. You know, he seemed he can run, but he seemed a little bit stiff at times, and his routes weren't there, very fluid. And then some of that is inexperience. I mean, he didn't play football for a whole year, so we'll see. If this offseason does, but he had he does have the ability to make plays outside his frame. He can catch it. He's got a big throwing box. I Man, you can throw it just about <laughs> anywhere in that box for him because he's got such a big wide frame. And he can go um, and get so it. It's exciting. He can go up and get it. You know, he kind of reminds me of a goal. He, you know, Carl Pickens had a great career, 1,000-yard mm-hmm. receiver, Pro Bowl receiver, and he wasn't very fluid. He wasn't the best route runner either, but he kept he caught that ball outside his frame very, very well. Hey, fellas, I'm going to have to go here in just a few minutes. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm sorry. No, that's great. Uh, hey, we really appreciate your time today. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, talking sports with us. Um, great first uh, great first call-in guest. Uh, hope hope we didn't disappoint you any either. Oh no, man! Anytime, <laughs> man. We can get, we can chop it up again sometime soon, man. I just, I hate to run on no, you, I, but I, you know, that's great. I'm actually at work right now. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just took a little break, man, well, just to call well, you all, well, and well, wait, you know, well, so I just wanted to make sure I get get on there with. You. Yeah, I, I appreciate it a lot. We're uh, we're I'm uh, we're gonna work on a couple more players. But like I said, you were number one on my list to to get in here. I'd also I mean, talk to Bernard Pollard, and we're working on Bernard coming on later. I was on his talk show a couple uh. <laughs> Years ago, a couple times. So, okay. So, and well, I, yeah, man. Good luck with the show, man. And if I can help again, just let me know. Thank you so right. much. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Hey, no problem, brothers. Yeah, have a good one. You too. Bye. Well, man, that was awesome. 
Yeah, it went good, I think. Uh, Kevin, like like we just said off air here, it's not his first time doing an interview. Obviously. Yeah, it was it was really good too. He carried it. He 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 helped carry it along. You know, we had some nerves for yeah. in that one. A lot of uh, huh, huh, huh. Uh, so like beating uh, some butt butthead butthead from in here. Yeah. Uh, the, I told you guys from the start I was gonna try to get a few names on here, and uh, I think we started out pretty strong. That's pretty pretty good name for me, and I know a lot of you people listening are sports fans, and some of you people that aren't sports fans, uh. I'm sorry. That was a special episode. Special episode. That was super, uh, super football. I mean, that was uh, as technical of football as what we'll probably get into. Yeah, we don't. We don't. We just touch on sports. But our thing is to get some sports people in here every now and then to talk. And I think in a, on a big scale of things, when you look at that Super Bowl team, and like he, like uh, Dyson mentioned, they were rock stars in Nashville. And anywhere they went, and still to this day, I guess maybe because the product too has not been very good. So when guys like um, uh, Eddie and Frank come into town, and I was going to ask him, well, maybe we'll get that next time if we talk to him again. You know, a lot of these guys come back to Nashville, and a lot of I mean, he works for 104.5, and a lot of these guys work on the radio. Mm-hmm. But they choose to come back to Nashville even after their careers. Uh, so I think it says a lot about Nashville. But you know, something we didn't get to talk to him about was that is is the work he's done after his football. So he's uh, he's head coach for the Independence High School here in Tennessee. Uh, he also helped start a program that's called Stars. Or I'm sorry, he's on the board of directors for a program called Stars. It's students taking a right stand, you know, and it, it's all about helping young people overcome social and emotional barriers through uh, innovative programs. Yeah, he's uh, he's really good at the community. He's always been good in the community, and like I said, uh, I wasn't just just telling him that. Like that was one of my m- main guys that I wanted to get on this show. That I'd kind of been harassing him for a couple days, trying to trying to get him to come on and. It's just because he's always been such a nice guy, and after his playing career, he's still involved heavily with the organization. He does uh, post and pregame shows down in Nashville, and he's just uh, he's just a good dude. I mean, you talk about a guy that, like I said, has the most famous play, two plays in Titans history, coming on and talk to us. Yeah, after our you know it's our fourth episode. Uh, definitely did not have to do that. Yeah, and, and that that was awesome of him. <laughs> he he seemed he he seemed interested too. You know, he seemed interested in talking to us. You know, and I think that has something to do with, uh, you know, this. Uh, like I was saying, him doing things like this stars. You know, like, um, uh, you know, just wanting to get out there and help people. And I think you know that's what I, th- I think that's what he was doing. Is you know he uh, he understood his uh, celebrity versus ours for sure, and then tried yeah. to come on and help us out. Yeah, he knows this means a lot more to, to us, us <laughs> than, it, than it did him. But like I said, he's probably done a thousand of these things and. Um, we're coming back at you Saturday with uh, uh, my little cousin Wesley. We're gonna come out with, uh, with Wesley. Wesley, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna do that do that diet nutrition. I've, I've got a bunch of fan questions out there right now. I've had yeah. a bunch of good questions. So, uh, so be looking for that Saturday. We're gonna get back into our regular stuff, some fitness and all that stuff. Uh, we got to talk about fitness because I've talked Lucas head off about everything else <laughs> the last two weeks, and he's yeah. he's gonna get his fitness in this yeah. week for all you people interested. We got your if fan ha- questions. If I have to turn his microphone off, I'm gonna talk about <laughs> fitness one of these days. I ramble sometimes. <laughs> all, all right, guys. Thanks everybody. Come back and see us. See you.